they've never known a day without being able to answer the, whatever question they have. Right? They, they were born with the smartphone in their hand. They were born with the internet. And that digital first immediacy is really one of the hallmarks of, of this group of people. Hello there and welcome to the My Future Business Show. This is the show that gets you in front of your best audience and keeps you there. I hope you're doing very well. And thank you for taking some time out to join us on the show. It's making all the difference knowing that the show is making a difference for you. Now, I know with podcasting, you can take us anywhere on the go. So no matter where you are, again, thank you very much for your support of the show. Now, on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming marketing and sales professional and accomplished author of several books, including Authenticity Marketing to Gen Z or Generation. Z, should I say, Mr. Emmanuel Rose. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yes. Now, you and I were just briefly talking about all of your work as an author, so I'm very much looking forward to taking a deep dive into that. But uh, we're obviously going to be covering a lot of different topics, including about the uh, three trends in marketing and business that we should be aware of, um, the future of marketing to Gen Z, and how to market authentically to them to achieve the best results in business. Now, there is certainly a lot to unpack there, Emmanuel. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you calling in from today? I'm calling in from Arcata, California, which is uh, up in the very northern part in the Redwoods, right on the coast. Yeah, wow. It's funny because, you know, if you go on the coast, you, you get a completely different experience in California, don't you, compared to where you are? Yeah, we're uh, we're really it's we call it an island because there's only uh, two lanes in and two lanes out and uh, more more trees than humans. So it's uh, it's pretty place. Do you like walking around there? What you what do you like to do when you're there? Absolutely, I, I moved here uh, purposely so I could backpack and fly fish. Oh, <laughs> I have not been disappointed. Fly no. fishing? Wow! Tell us a little bit about that. That sounds like fun. Yeah, so there's uh, this in this area. There's six six rivers and uh, a bunch of anadromous fish like uh, salmon and steelhead. And um, there, uh, people come from all over the world to to fish fish here for uh, for steelhead for the fly rod. So steelhead, it's pretty pretty bonus. Yeah, never ever heard of that fish before. There you go. I've learned something today. There you go. It's a rainbow trout that. Uh, is is born in the freshwater, travels out to the ocean for a couple of years, and then comes back to freshwater to spawn. As soon as you said rainbow trout, I knew exactly what you were talking about. So thank you very much. <laughs> there you go. You can tell I'm not a fisherman of, of any sort. <laughs> now I know that uh, I know that California can sometimes be uh, subject to some pretty horrendous uh, uh, fires. Horrendous fires. Is it warm over there at the moment? Are you in that sort of location? Uh, let's see. Where we are, it stays it stays pretty cool, and there are uh, there were some fires last year farther east from us, but in general, the redwoods are so big and old they don't burn they don't burn well. Uh, so it's it's fortunate for us, but yeah, there's there's fires very close to us for sure. Yeah. Uh, the last couple of years. Now tell us, man, you are you a, are you a pet lover? Absolutely, I have an English Springer Spaniel. They're not a big dog, are they? But they're quite smart, or or the, or the yeah. opposite. <laughs> Yeah, he is. He's a smart aleck for sure. Uh, <laughs> his name's Texas, and uh, he's. I've trained him for, as a bird hunting dog, so he's he's exceedingly smart and athletic. Yeah, very good, and keeps you on the go. I'm pretty sure on certain of that. Now, yes. uh, we always spend some time, Emmanuel, talking about um, your your background growing up, because it gives context to, I guess, the formative years that led you to become the individual that you are today. So, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and whether or not there were some influential people in your life that you can recall. Absolutely. There's, uh, I grew up on the mean streets of Modesto, California, which is in the central Valley. And, uh, in, in those days it was, it was still, uh, still half rural agriculture and, and half houses, you know, in the interceding times, it's, uh, just houses for the most part. Um, so we had a lot of access to, uh, to kind of, uh, outdoor activities and Yosemite is just like two hours away from there. So it spent a lot of time um, camping and hunting and fishing and enjoying, enjoying nature. Um, the, the, the business side of things, my grandfather was probably the biggest influence on me. He, uh, he owned a jewelry store in mm -hmm. downtown Modesto and uh, you know, as kind of a sole proprietor, gemologist, um, you know, one man show, uh, <laughs> I saw the, <laughs> the the trials and tribulations of 
being dependent on on uh, certain customers in order to keep things afloat in in that kind of brick and mortar environment for sure so what's the one thing do you think that he taught you about the most was it discipline was it uh, customer focus what's the one thing that you can re recall mostly really would be customer focus yeah and and uh, focusing on key accounts of course that's not what he would he, he would have said but that was what he he role modeled um for you know he would do these annual events right before the holidays where you know he'd do the champagne and caviar and and the you know the the, the people who were his best clients would, would come and and do their christmas shopping before the holidays and and he took care of them made sure everything was customized the way they wanted it to be it's it's really interesting isn't it like when we're growing up as children we don't really recognize that we're in those early formative years and the things that we're exposed to at that time help us to become the individuals we are and running the businesses and the authors that we're, we've become now tell us a little bit about your first experience as an entrepreneur what were you doing wow well my very first was about i was about five years old and i answered one of those magazine ads to sell seeds because I, I wanted to buy a bb gun i, I know it sounds <laughs> it sounds like a hollywood story but it was the, it's the truth and uh and so i went door to door and took orders with my mom for you know like packets of peas and and sunflowers and uh you know i don't even know I probably sold 10 packets of seeds but it, you know it was enough my parents uh took pity on me and ordered the that, that BB gun for me. <laughs> <laughs> good old, good old parents. I gotta love them. <laughs> now, I, I, you know, when I when I got to a, the ripe old age of, I think it was thirteen, I got my first paid job. What was your first paid job? First paid job uh, was uh, crawling under the the uh, foundation of houses and, and and shoveling out the dirt so there was enough room for the termite inspector to crawl around and and do his job so that was uh that was as you would expect a rather scary and uncomfortable and dirty job which <laughs> reinforced my desire to get an education <laughs> you, you know what's really funny about that emmanuel is that when i was growing up i did that for fun not necessarily cutting out <laughs> trenches but <laughs> my nana and pop had a house on stilts and that's what we did for fun we'd crawl underneath their, oh. i guess their posts in the house and looking back i'm thinking what was i thinking <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit about what your day looks like at the moment emmanuel are you an early riser yeah, I get up uh, every day at about uh, uh, 10 to 4 and uh, spend the, the first hour of the day in, in some kind of a meditation practice. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from there, get a little bit of work done, some writing. Um, and then, you know, kind of middle of the morning, we'll take a coffee break with my wife and have a mocha and a chat and then uh, client work you know, through the middle of the day, kind mm -hmm. of marketing agency. And so the, uh, the creatives and the project managers are doing the heavy lifting and I'm helping to keep things focused on strategy and, and timelines. And, uh, and then most afternoons, if the weather is permitting, then I, I'll play golf with my wife because she is an absolute golf addict. Oh, she beat you often? Uh, yeah, she's she's the golfer between the two of us. And if, and you know so, what? Even if you could beat her, you know you shouldn't, right? <laughs> yeah, right. You, if, if I win, I lose. If I lose, I lose. <laughs> you lose, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this brings us to a quite a relevant point is the, I guess, the ability to build a lifestyle that allows us to live with our family, spend time with our loved ones. How, how valuable is that for you? Uh, it is really, I think, why part of the reason why we're incarnated. Right, is to is to have take care of all the domains of of our our life and our our, our being and and not just not just to be working and and um be solely focused on work and money constantly mm. that, that's not a good way to live i i don't think 
No, absolutely. Yeah. I value this feedback and the insight into your life because it really gives some great context for those young uh, entrepreneurs who are just starting out and they, they haven't walked the road that we've necessarily walked yet. They're looking to because I'm certainly aware of them. They're um, providing a lot of feedback to the show, so they'll be taking a lot of value out of what you're saying now. Tell me, um, it would have taken, uh, I guess, a bit of courage and certainly an element of risk starting your own business. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I had uh, I had run through some a, a streak of, of two uh, very uh, I would say un uh, unsatisfying jobs. One where uh, I had uh, I had built a big book of, book of business for a person, and um, and they reneged on a on a bonus that oh, I was owed. So, yeah. Um, so you know these life lessons that, that was about the third time that it happened to me. And uh, I can't. I, I was naive enough to think just because I had a signed contract that that would be uh, enough to to force the, the issue. <laughs> 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 as we know, as we know, that's just part of it. Yep. Um, and then I went into another role where uh, I I just wasn't appreciated, and and I got I actually got fired from that job, which was uh, the first time I had been fired. And uh, and I just sat down with myself and I said, well, clearly. Clearly, I'm I'm the I'm the factor here. I must be unmanageable. So <laughs> I better I better just do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love that sort of a story because I think we can only learn through our failures. And I guess if you want to call being fired a failure, you, you really took a, a lot away from that because it was I guess it was that tangential moment in in time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's, I, and I think that's kind of one of the themes of my life is um, in these transition times is to, to sit down and take some time, you know, preferably on a rock next to a river, but even just sitting in my office and saying, well, what's going on? What am I trying to do, you know, in the next five years, in the next 10 years? What am I, and what do I need to do today to start to facilitate that? And, uh, and just more like, uh, observing and paying attention to the bigger situation to then get into the, the head down, butt up tactics of it. We seem to do a dance in our head, don't we, quite a lot. Did you battle with that? What was your mindset like? And, you know, how did you get back on track when you had those days where it was like too hard? Well, I mean, it's it's scary. And, and you know, the, like uh, Thomas Hobbes says, life is nasty, short and brutish. And there's those days when it just feels like everything's, you know, peaked against you or even against me and uh, to just really stay focused on, on the big picture. And, you know, first is the survival and the, the fundamental of needing to take care of myself. And then, um, you know, the next, the next layer out as far as being cre creative and helping people take care of their concerns uh, with my creativity. Yeah, thank you again for sharing. Now, I'd love to, I always do this, so I'm, I'm a big fan of movies and I love to think about if I was a superhero, who would I be and what would be, be my one thing? What's your one thing do you think right now? What do you do best? Uh, I would just say like it, that Bruce Willis uh, character, I think it was in Unbreakable by M. Night. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, this kind of, this uh, dogged perseverance. It's almost, uh, I, I, Sometimes I look at my situation from third party and I just go, what is wrong with that guy? Why can he not just take <laughs> no? Why can't he take the hint? <laughs> uh, love it. Absolutely love it. Now, I was um, looking over your bio, uh, your bio, Emmanuel, and uh, I noticed something that really stood out for me was that your, your focus on writing. Um, how important is writing for you? And is it, you know, the only creative source that you have? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting kind of push pull. I I would say I don't love writing, mm -hmm. but uh, it's so it's important. I think that for me to be able to get these things out that I I can't uh, express during typical day to day conversation with people. Um, so for instance, I have a book of poetry that I'm working on that are, is based on uh, experiences I've had outdoors in wilderness and. Um, I just finished this poem about the hunter's moon and it was a, an episode that happened in last October where there was just a, a moon rise and I'm in my hunting camp, you know, just having dinner and, and how deeply triggered almost to a tear I got from, mm. from just that scene. Right. So 
that kind of conversation doesn't come up at the golf course or or at Kinko's with somebody in line. So I think for me, it's uh, it's that cathartic uh, part of it. Um, and then it helps to crystallize what, again, what I'm thinking, but then in terms of the business perspective and, you know, the, the idea where I got triggered by this 68 million new humans coming into, into the marketplace in the United States. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, that seems like that's going to be a big deal at some point. I better, I better figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, this is where we shift gears and we start talking about generation Z and, you know, let's talk about some, I guess, some demographic psychographic information. And you've obviously just touched on the reason why you thought it was important to start uh, uh, focusing on this generation. Tell us a little bit about them. Who are they? Uh, what age group are they? And why are they important? Yeah, so they're these these people that are under 26 years old. So they're like 13 to 26, 11 to 26 in there. Um, and um, they are the the most ethnic, ethnically diverse people in the United States. So they're almost half of them are mixed race. And, and so that drives a lot of their uh, philosophy and ethics around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so whatever we believe about this politically or uh, our own philosophy around it, they believe it and it's their reality. Um, they're super ethical and committed to, uh, to, inclusion and then also the the environment and 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 that drives their behavior in terms of wanting to um, interact and engage with with people and companies and brands that that mirror uh, their beliefs just like we all do yes fantastic feedback because there's certainly some i guess some opportunities and some challenges that come with that given the the fact that we currently mark market to previous generations what what's the one big shift that you're seeing the biggest shift and i see this as a challenge in my day-to-day work with clients is Mm -hmm. is bringing the business leader the ceo or manager whoever that person is in as the the primary influencer and um, modeling it after Richard Branson or Kylie Jenner, and and, and taking the uh, the the role as influencer for the for the business, the brand, and products, um, so that they're the lightning rod, and they're communicating um, not just the not just the business part, but then also the uh, the way that the the company's involved in the in the communities, uh, local and and regional, and and the environment. There seems to be a lot of rubbish out there in terms of marketing and social messaging, be it political or whatever else. They seem to be very savvy, not only technically savvy, but in they've just got the smarts. Are you noticing that? Yeah, they're they are, and that's a great observation. Uh, they're they're super intelligent, and on top of that, they're the most educated Americans that that are uh, have ever been as well. So. Uh, they they value they value that education and and part of it is because they've never known a day without being able to answer the, whatever question they have right they they were born with the smartphone in their hand they were born with the internet and and that that digital first immediacy is really one of the hallmarks of of this group of people. Yeah, it's interesting. When you and I grew up, we used to drink out of the water hose outside in the heat. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of the times now, I look at my own kids, they never go outside. I'm wondering, are they missing out on anything in that regard? Well, they, they absolutely are. And um, and we know through all the studies around brain chemistry and dopamine and, and these big dumps that happen that there's they're not just missing out on things, but there's also some long-term effects that are happening to their brains. But the... The positive side is that mm. they are really focused on um, ev- uh, on experiences. Like when they don't just want to go and buy something, they want to go and um, have an experience with it. So, um, you know, we used to it used to be like going to Costco and getting the tasters was our experience, right? That was <laughs> a new thing. Going to Whole Foods and 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 that was an experience. But now they want to go and if they're going to buy. Uh, if they're going to buy a car, then they go on and see and, and feel the car top tent. They want to see the slack line. They want to have music playing. You know, they want to have some food and some sparkling cider or whatever so that it is um, 
a human experience that we would take for granted, but has not been part of the fabric of their uh, of their life growing up to this time. See, if I can recall, I was extremely young, and I can vaguely recall being in front of my nana's big box TV watching uh, elements of the Falklands War unfolding. And um, that was, you know, that dates me a little bit, but <laughs> um, what I recognize from that, Emmanuel, is that nowadays they don't have those filters as much. It's on-demand media for them. You know, do they, do they have, uh, I guess, more of an ability to shut out the noise in this respect nowadays, do you think? I would say, yeah, they um, they have a, a giant filter uh, in um, both for, um, you know, and that's a positive thing, right? Of course. Because they're very, very discerning on, on whether um, whether the message is um, um, resonates with them or they perceive it as true. But then it also means that you you've got to figure out how to how to get your message to them through one of those channels. And you talk about channels and in the past, um, it was try to be on all channels all at once to try to get as many access to as many people as we can. What is this, is this an old strategy that's no, no longer relevant? Do we need to use multi-channel marketing, do you think? I think there's still a need for multi-channel, but I, I think if you were to say the multi-channel now would be uh, you know, more of an idea of user generated content and influencer marketing, and social CEO. So, um, it's still multi, but it is, is coming in through, uh, the, the means that, that, uh, are reaching them, right. The, the, the TikTok videos, uh, both product oriented and, and humorous is a channel. And then, you know, user generated content is, it's such a tough nut to crack for most small businesses. Um, but it's still critical. It's funny because I, I watch YouTube videos that are quite critical of other people who have made those videos on, say, a product review, and they never monetized <laughs> those channels. And <laughs> if I could get one dollar for every video watched that they had, they'd be multi-millionaires. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I know a lot of uh, a lot of people are looking at this show, thinking, "Well, I'm here to learn about marketing." And given that we're talking about marketing to Generation Z, what do you think I should start with? What would you say to people? Well, the the fundamental, and I don't uh, is that um, the the CEO has got to be the 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 show, mm. the primary. That's really critical, and um, I recommend that people go and and take a look in, in, at Gary Vaynerchuk and look at his sixty four part content strategy from the single piece of video, right? Yep. And 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 then develop a very straightforward or simple content calendar that week one you're going to talk about your staff and and the staff that you're excited about week two you're going to talk about the company's in, involvement in community events whether that's rotary or big boys and you know boys and girls club yep. uh, whatever those things that your people are involved in and then um you know week three you would do a, a something about supply chain and maybe a little bit of product and then week four, you would do something about yourself and what you're into. And in one or two minutes of video on each of those things and then build out uh, a content plan from that is, is the, the foundation of, um, of touching this group. Plus, it's going to get the rest of us interested also. So positive, uh, positive other actions that happen. Yeah, the, when you talked about Gary, I, I think about the what is it the jab 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 right hook it's not all about selling is it no and it you know it's 10 or 15 pieces to one in terms of uh feeling and feel good and involvement and to to selling and um they're they're savvy enough that if they need what you have they're going to be able to do the research they need uh once you've touched them in a, you know with other types of content this is great uh, conversation because there's a lot of people on here be really interested in what we're talking about now, is email marketing still effective? For this group, it's not not as high of a priority. So, uh, you know, for for people our age, the gray hairs, you know, it's still it's still um, effective. Uh, even the millennials a little bit, but uh, this group, you really it, it, you want to be focused on um, having that uh, your your web presence buffed out in a way that. Um, that feeds them information, lets them self-educate. Mm -hmm. um, so 
to do a deep dive in in that that process the you know the the the, the customer funnel uh, from that perspective and and then give them lots of ways to interact and do um, you know surveys or gamif gamified activities and um, and then keep focusing on how uh, how you're helping the people that they are concerned about. So why was it that, uh, you know, what uh, led you to write the book, Authenticity Marketing to Generation Z? Where did this, I guess, the genesis for the idea behind the book come from? Well, there's, you know, there's two things, right? I call it this kind of uh, selfish altruism. Um, one was I had, I had had this this idea and I did the Amazon search and I was like, there's only one book. <laughs> <laughs> about this and i'm like well this is something that i i don't know a lot about it yet but i know that i can uh i can figure this out right mm, yeah uh, and then uh, looking around and talking to um to my clients and and you know people in the business community where i am and and it just wasn't on anybody's radar yet and and so those two factors said well you know here's a chance for me to um to ride uh ride this wave of humans through probably the rest of my career really yep um, and so it, it felt evergreen in that respect and uh in a service to my clients one of the things that really stood off off the jumped off the page for me was how you talked about ai in other books and i was wanting to ask you about um you know it's the difference between knowing what's real and and what's not and i wonder if um, generation z can really recognize it given how good ai looks like it's becoming very quickly tell us a little bit about your perspective on that wow it is uh it is amazing to watch the ai crank through uh, the marketing world right now and the proliferation of tools that are coming out every day um and yeah i do uh, i I, I do think that they have the ability to um, to discern what's what's uh, real and and what's generated by a machine, so to speak. I I gave uh, I did a lecture uh, last week uh, at workshop, and I luckily I had two uh, Gen Z uh, students in there, <laughs> and so I was able to uh, to. To, to have real life, you know, people in the laboratory, which was really cool. Yep. And, and, you know, the, I think that's the thing is that they are, they're really attuned to, and, and in a way that we is just in their intuition about what is accurately coming out of a person and what is, uh, is machine generated BS. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think they take notice of the older generation and the knowledge that they have? You know, I think, they do i know that they deeply deeply respect their parents and, yeah. and that's one thing that you know i mean there's a lot of times there's generation bashing and and um and and i think there's so many good things about this group of people um and and how highly ethical they are and how they live their values um and i think it's uh they're still young enough that you know the men the male brain hasn't even developed yet right 25 no. is about when it develops so <laughs> yeah. <and there's, laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the jury is still out on some of these other behaviors because they haven't been alive long enough to to get into it yeah um, but the you know like um they're just coming into the idea of home ownership and and all these things um so we we don't know a lot about those specifics but you know i think my my observation is that they're about five years developmentally behind where some of these other generations were at, at their age at their age and some of that is from the pandemic and some of that is just from the way they were parented yeah absolutely thank you for this feedback I'm really really enjoying it now i know that you have a library of other books tell us a little bit about the books before we swing around back to the current book that we're talking about sure yeah um well i'm working on on a deep dive into uh a, a book um it's called the social media edge and it's about the social ceo mm -hmm. and uh employee advocacy and marrying those two things together yep. and employee advocacy is very simply when a business or a brand leverages their employees social media accounts in order to push the brand messages and it's something that Fortune 500 has been doing very effectively for the last decade, and it's still 
hasn't really trickled down into small and mid-sized businesses yet. So I'm, I'm proselytizing on, on, on both those um, tactics in, in this book, the social media edge. And then uh, the third one, which I can't write fast enough, uh -huh. I can't decide if I should, should wait or do it now because I feel like there's going to be so many rewrites, is uh, authentic marketing in the age of AI. Yeah. Yes, that's definitely a relevant topic, isn't it? Wow, but it, like we were talking about earlier, it's just so dynamic. It's hard to it's hard to grasp onto the water as it falls out of the sky. Yeah, you know what? There's there's a book is only written one uh, is finally written once is rewritten a dozen times. Um, <laughs> how how long does it take you to actually get through a book to a point uh, that you think you know what this is done? Close the book. Uh, you know, I I just looked to it, it takes you know anywhere from three to six months, and then I'm kind of like you just said. Um, I, I'm one of these ready, fire, aim guys. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember that marketing book, yep. um, and so I will, I will t treat the topic in, in, in a fullness, and then um, send it out and uh, you know out in the world. That's what I've done with the authenticity and send it out pre pre. I, I think I'm on my fifth version now. In, wow! In, you know, in three months, four months. Yeah. Um, that's not bad. Three, three, four months is quite, quite rapid, really. Yeah. So, um, so that's been, uh, I say nobody's smarter than the marketplace and I, I have, I have to take my own medicine on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for sharing. Now tell me, um, what is the structure of the book and, and, and what can readers expect to find inside chapter by chapter, if you don't mind? Sure. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's, I call it duct tape simple, um, uh, in that, of just look at um, the idea of here's the generation and here's some demographic and psychographic information mm -hmm. uh, talking about the digital revolution. That's the first chapter at, that it's, it's continuing <laughs> we're, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. on this wave <laughs> <laughs> and then making the case for the social CEO uh, employee advocacy, and then digging into values driven marketing and, uh, and, why we need to identify what our values are mm -hmm. they, they always exist it just a lot of times it's not part of the marketing campaigns yep um and then looking at the e-commerce and and e commercizing at every aspect of the business so that it can be done on a smartphone yes um, and that's you know b2c is not as challenging as b2b and so a lot of times there's pushback for e-commerce because in our industry we can't do that um, no <laughs> yeah, we certainly are going mobile aren't we though that's that's the truth oh so. yeah yeah for sure it's amazing it's been it's been very freeing and then uh, yeah and then a deep dive into demographics and psychographics if people are interested and then looking at um some successful campaigns and then some helpful hints on getting started well, importantly, in all of this, Emmanuel, where, where can people buy your books? Is it, can you get them from your website? Is it, an, a, is it an Amazon thing? Yeah, you know, at this point, it's from, it's from the website, AuthenticMarketingTheGenerationZ.com. Right. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to go to Amazon or not. I, I, as a marketer, I don't want to lose control of my customer list. <laughs> Ah, yes, of course. Yeah, that's fair enough. You know what? This is about marketing after all. It makes uh, makes good sense to want to know uh, who you've sold to and so you can continue the conversation. I think that's really what this is all about, is being able to engage with the right people, in this case, Generation Z, and it's helping people who are, I guess, more traditional marketers, learning about new generations and the differences in what they need. So tell us a little bit about your website, the domain name, and what people are going to find on there. You bet. Uh, the the um, company's name is strategicemarketing.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's lots of uh, blog posts and, and on a variety of marketing topics. And uh, and from there, then that, that takes it over to the strategic adventure marketing, mm -hmm. where, it, where the book is, is, is housed. And there's, uh, if you're an adventure based business, then there's content over there for, uh, for that kind of kind of uh, nature lover business. Excellent. Thank you for the feedback. Now, in, in terms of uh, onboarding and when people want to work with you or connect with you directly, what's the process behind it? And who do you serve mostly? So, yeah, we are, um, I've 
background in manufacturing, and mm-hmm. so that's that's a primary a primary vertical for us. Um, and um, and then also uh, through comedy of errors, my wife is a health club uh, developer, so we're very <laughs> skilled with health and fitness marketing. Also, very good, very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, yeah, I like to connect with people on LinkedIn, and uh, and then uh, from there, we uh, we have a conversation and see if uh, if what the needs are match what my capabilities are, and uh, if not, then I'll make a, a referral to somebody else who I think might help uh, help in a better way. Well, that's that's really what it's all about being able to serve others with uh, solutions that you know are going to make a difference in their, in their world. And you certainly do a wonderful job with all of your books. And it's a real credit to you, Emmanuel. And um, with regard to finding the links to this particular episode back to strategic e-marketing, which is strategic with an e marketing.com. I'll be making sure that the link is available available below this post. No matter where you see the call, you're going to find the links back to Emmanuel and all of his wonderful work. And Emmanuel, thank you so very much for joining me on the My Future Business Show today. Thank you so much, Rick. I really appreciate the conversation and all your questions. 